Yo ho ho, all you beautiful people, welcome to another FEF League Online. Eric and Mark here with you beauties for a little weekend recap, and we get to really dive in to the LCS and LEC with both Korea and China on that Lunar New Year break. So it's a whole lot more Western action over the weekend. Yeah, it's mixed feelings when the Lunar New Year break comes through because you do feel sad. You miss out on the excitement from the LCK and the LPL and, of course, conversation about those elite teams and how they're shaping up and faring out. But it does give you that other side of the coin, that extra attention, extra time to spend with the LCS and LEC. And sometimes that's not necessarily good time spent. But you know what? This past weekend, interesting, fun, and exciting things happening in both the LEC and LCS. And it's always good times ahead when you're watching G2 Esports in best of fives, in peak performance because the upper bracket uh, finals against BDS, this was a draft canyon across the board. It felt like G2, they were just throwing stuff at the wall and everything was sticking. I mean, you start things off, game one was just an absolute master class of movement around the map from sneaking a baron right under the noses of bds caps was an that's the biggest raid boss azir i have ever seen in a game yeah I and mean, that says nothing about how quick the twisted fate up in the top side was able to move around the map mr broken blade showing us that technology early in this matchup yes it was, it was a lot of things good from g2 early but at the very least as you mentioned out the raid boss azir from caps it was simply a checklist of oh wait does your team have caps on it yep that's that's looking that's a pretty win. good <laughs> that's looking pretty good for you guys and if your scorecard has the x there oh Oh, that's not looking so good for you. And that's how it played out for BDS. And you could see that, I think, overall struggles still even with, uh, you know, added. Look at them experimenting, trying some new things, trying to work some stuff into that repertoire. And maybe not exactly having the showing that they wanted individually as well. Yeah, and obviously that TF pick, I think, is one of the main reasons G2 was able to just dance around and get objectives and straight up winning trades, not even trades really just getting objectives across the map in game two game two or game two is a whole lot different you get the flex Cassante pick and we get to see bb go yasuo which is the age-old counter into that nar for adam and you can even highlight the lilia for yike which is always the pocket pick that sits there belveth was being banned pretty often in this series it's it's just impossible to ban out g2 you can't, you can't, because again, you, you're not gonna ban out probably a lot of these individual players talking about specifically Caps, number one, but you could probably throw Yike into that category really fast in the way that he has come through, obviously, individual pocket picks as the Belveth, as you already mentioned, then you can go through the meta champions that you're gonna have to go through, and then you got backups, something like the Lilia that you mentioned and you see in this game two of the series, really thought that this was G2 flexing on the rest of the LEC to have a team like BDS show the improvements, show gains from last year, and especially from that international event, Worlds uh, at the end of it, and say, that's still not going to be good enough to cut it at the top level of the LEC. And this series, the level up was uh, almost exponential because as this third game was rolling around, we got to see Caps again on Huey and my God, the, him on this champion versus anyone else we've seen play it is just a different stratosphere and it's a completely different comp again we get to see broken blade this time pop off on Cassante, and i know this has been at the front of so many conversations but this champion has reached levels of being out of control that surpass anything we even saw last year and all of 2023 he was out of control it's become rapidly a situation where it needs to be thrown into the same type of categories. I think as Rise, as Zoe, you know, Zary was in that type of territory as well, where it was just so much that I think the only real thing to do is to wipe the board clean, knock it down all the way out of any type of real level of proper play, and then build it back up slowly. Add little things here or there, add a boost, all these whatever, to get it into that sweet spot. Because for a champion with his design and his capabilities, that sweet spot's gonna be really close, really hard to get in every type of balance patch. And let me tell you, we've not hit it in any of these balance patches. And you've seen that 
all across pro play all across the regions and you've seen that all across every weekend that you've been watching professional play broken blade on g2 for g2 in game three is a clear example of that as well good things going on for g2 in this game three as you already mentioned was cats on the way i think we have seen this champion across a couple regions now mostly and you know all around the board really on where it's being played but Caps has looked the most lethal and the most in control of this champion that has so many possibilities. And again, I throw in an Ivern for Yike. The last two games in this series, he was deathless. He went 10, 0, and 28 assists in those two back-to-back -back wins for G2. Clearly a, a tier ahead of what BDS was putting out on the day. The guy who probably had the least fun was Han Sama. He just got to play Kalista three games in a row, which, by the way, was a pick that was permabanned against G2 at Worlds last year. Yeah, and, but then that you enter into the territory of what happens in a best of series against G2. And when you have threats like Caps, like Yike has emerged himself as to be and represent and play on the day, you start shifting your pick bands around, you gotta leave something up. And that is where that Callista comes through. And you better believe, even if he's not having the most fun, most interactive time as an ADC out there on the rip, he's got his comfort pick. He's on the winning side. Things are good for Mr. Hansam. G2 can just vibe their way into the next round and wait for the next challenger. BDS back to the drawing board to say, okay, we can't beat G2. Should be able to handle most other people in the LEC before we level up for a rematch against G2. Tell you who's really not ready for those final bosses. That is Team Heretics matching up against SK Gaming. And you thought maybe some of that old G2 magic was there after game one where they have this semi-miraculous fight in the tight corridor uh, of their jungle where they get an ace on SK and you think... Here they come. Wonders activated. Perks has a nice Azir shuffle. He's looking like peak form. Here come heretics. But it was short-lived. Uh, here comes heretics and here comes the mistakes, I think is the one that we really should have seen coming in this series. And for SK, props to them because they were certainly opportunistic and certainly able to capitalize on a lot of these mistakes that came through from this team heretic side and certainly one where you got to be looking at this series as that missed opportunity because these veteran players what they should have been able to do and how they should have been able to take that control that they had of the series close it out not acceptable when you're looking at this one from heretic side and it's not like these are you know forgivable difficult mistakes like ah they got that bear and they snuck it from underneath blah 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 it's individual perks is whiffing on azir shuffles around wonders getting solo killed by a malphite as a nar even yankos looked a little bit off in this series and was not in places that he needed to be and then much like earlier in the split we saw perks's akali versus caps's akali we had to see perks's way versus caps's and it's not even a fair comparison I was really not. And I think that this is one of those ones where, you know, sure, there's some conversation about actual, you know, just raw talent of the players. And that can be a whole other thing. But I think as far as it is right now, it's about form and the mental focus that is there for these two players. And you can see that difference out there on the rift and the execution on all these champions. I mean, even you know, looking at all the other gameplay as well from uh, Perks is one of those ones we're looking through. This Heretics ex experiment was only going to work if you were able to get the Perks that was going to be the leader, going to be somebody that was changing the fate of the game with his own calls, with his own plays. He's been changing the fate the wrong way has been the way that it has looked for this Heretics team. As you already mentioned out, not the only player making individual mistakes on this team, but certainly as the guy that you want to be that leader for this team, for you know the, five, the four other guys that you're rolling with, wasn't working on the day. And I don't know what you do going forward as Heretics with this roster in terms of keeping it the same, or if you feel like you can just level up with these five, I don't know what changes you make. That's where we see these hyper-accelerated off-seasons, what teams are able to scrap together if they feel like they finished lower results than they were anticipating. But hey, kudos to SK. They definitely leveled up and bounced back from what we saw out of them against Vitality uh, last weekend. Yeah, and then this type of, of play from SK is going to be necessary as they move further into this bracket as well. They're going to, they can't be counting on as many mistakes or many, as many obvious mistakes, really, I should say, coming across from their opponents the way that it did in Heretics in this series after dropping 
that first game to them. So it's going to have to be a lot tighter for this SK team. But I think they've certainly shown that in their bright spots, they can hang in this territory at the very least in this lower bracket area of the LEC. The last playoff series in the LEC this weekend, Mad Lions Koi, they, they just kicked the door down in game one and it hit Giant X right in the face. And the door never got off them because this was a 50-minute 2-0 sweep out of Mad Lions. Uh, I mean, the highlight's probably Frescawi looking like an absolute animal, especially on that Tristana game. And that was maybe the one matchup you felt like Jackies might have had an edge over him, rookie to rookie, but he stepped up in a big way in this set. Oh, this is big for Mad Lions Koi to see Frescawi pop off like that in this best of series with what you can possibly have, this road ahead of you remaining for this winter split. That is that proper sign that you want. And as you mentioned out, getting that head-to-head -head matchup, rookie to rookie against Jackies, who has shown us those glimpses, that power that we know that that potential will be there. You getting ahead of that one in this series, that best of working well with the rest of the team, that is a big one for me looking at Mad Lions Court. The recipe of El Yoya giving a whole lot of attention uh, to Supa and Alvaro in that bot lane has been working I mean, obviously, pretty damn well for them. And then you combine Mirwin, maybe the most exciting top laner in the LEC to watch, even when he's not on crazy picks. Like Gwen and Akali, obviously, big carries in the top lane, but not crazy off meta like a fiddlesticks, but it doesn't matter the pick. Mad Lions are one of the most exciting squads in the LEC right now. They're fresh, man. That's what it is. It's a fresh taste out there on the Rift, and especially in the pro world that we've been living in for the last little bit and how stale the meta has been more so favored towards getting these fresh picks the way that they're playing you love to see that the young talent for this mad lions team getting this win building off of these type of things this is a you know this is a long year right guys you got to keep that in perspective and looking at this winter split and getting these successes getting these check marks getting this experience early for this team and growing through it all very important things that we're going to be checking back up on weeks months from now as we're looking at this mad lines koi team now i'd be sweating or at least a little nervous whoever's matching up against mad lions going forward as these playoffs roll on because it is a breath of fresh air with four of these rookies alongside el yoya if we're giving away the certified sticker banger of the weekend across both uh eu and na it's got to go to 100 thieves and cloud nine and a lot of the time, bangers, they got a they got a positive and a negative association with it. Anytime you're getting Berserkers back on Zeri, he's getting pentakills immediately on her, and a couple massive throws, and Cloud9 ends up losing the game. But the ending to this game is the entire full like minute and a half sequence to close things out was absolutely nutty. It's fantastic because for about two, three minutes before it's going towards the end, you know, we're ending with a base race and then you get the base race that pretty much is like a whole minute, minute and a half that it goes on down to the wire. This was a good one in the LCS. True barn burner is the nice one people like to say on these ones. It was really fun seeing this matchup. Maybe not obviously the highest quality of League of Legends. There is something to be said about that, but brawling, a mud brawl, I'll say, out in the LCS between these two. Getting it done, you had Berserker popping off, making these big plays, only for Jojo Pion and the rest of Cloud9 to oh. kind of make some real boneheaded choices. One of the worst individual performances out of Jojo that we've maybe seen in his young career, but usually Akali's a pick we're ready to see him pop off on. Him coupled with these bar journeys was, uh, it wasn't it today for C9. Yeah, and that's one that I think anybody has experienced in the solo queue <laughs> playgrounds, realizing, you know what? That was an that was a barred portal that helps the enemy team, not not me, not for us, you guys, even if it's on our own side. Uh, Jojo Pian, this is certainly one to look at the individual performance and you can and we can criticize it and, and question it and look at it. But I think the bigger question is for Cloud9, number one is going to be something I, I want to talk about a little bit later here is about how it how tough it is right now in the LCS to be a top team and to stay a top team the next week as it is with the live patch situation and all those preparations. And number two, I think it's just this communication, getting on the same page. It seems to be that we thought that it would be so instant. Of course, the personalities, everything like that, play styles of Blabber, Jojo Pian, the rest of Cloud9, it'll all just fall in. It hasn't quite worked out like that. And I think it's going to take some time obviously given the the mistakes and errors that we have seen in order to iron it out 
positive side of things, we thought Cloud9 would need way less time than a squad like 100 Thieves, who now quietly have a four game win streak or sitting pretty in second place. I know Sniper has hit the ground running. He's solo killing Impact and Fudge this weekend. How about the disrespect everybody was giving Quid last year? They were ready to send him back to the LCK and now he is the legit win con and was a massive threat and has been all split long. He's been an all pro mid laner. He has been a very steady development for this 100 Thieves lineup this year, and that is one of those strong things, one of those reassuring things that you love to see in the development of a young player, the way that he is stably able to build himself up and hold his own in this in this way, and the way he's, I think, growing outside the rift. That's the other thing you got to be thinking about as an import, a young player coming over and, and you know, a young, a young person becoming a young adult is the big thing as well. I think he's handled that well and showing it. And you're seeing that product on the rip, how confident he's playing, how cool, collected this 100 Thieves team looks. I think the big thing here is not changing the expectations, the pressure on this 100 Thieves lineup still looked as an underdog, unexpected growth, all these type of things. You do need to now realize as 100 Thieves how volatile the LCS has been, that there is gonna be an opportunity that if you get right, you get hot, you keep improving, you're gonna have a chance to play some very meaningful games even as soon as this spring split. Even with a couple of rookies on the squad and River getting dropped in, he's also fit in seamlessly and is probably one of the main reasons why Quid has looked so much better uh, early on in this spring split. At least Cloud9, despite a pretty big throw against 100T, at least they were able to eke out a win earlier in the weekend against NRG, but again, it was kind of because a horrible early three-man dive from NRG, who, by the way, now have a four-game losing streak after another 0-2 weekend. Yeah, you can chalk it up. Another one for the LCS top teams rolling on in to these hot three, four-game losing streaks. You hate to see it at the very top of the LCS, but that's what I was talking about with Cloud9. It's so hard with this live patch thing that we are seeing. Maybe the changes aren't so drastic, but the fact that there are a couple little tweaks here or there, you gotta practice it, you gotta know it, you gotta be prepared for all these other little things. That focus, that pre pre preparation is not there for these top teams to stay locked in onto the meta and onto the performance the way they have been with a more stagnant, with more traditional spacing between the patches. I think that that is what we are seeing at the top of the LCS and why it's so easy and so quick that we're seeing so many of these losing streaks, so many swip swap into places of all these teams where nobody has been able to take that stranglehold and really run away with the lead of the LCS. And we saw, you know, teams are trying to implement some things. I think we had three different Smolder games in his debut this week and I mean, to varying degrees of impacts, I, the one game he got actually like 200 plus passives and became uh, an actual late game threat, but still way too small a sample size to really form any opinion about it. Uh, I'll take it. I'll take it at this point. Something new in the bottom lane, especially one of the very lanes that we need to see some new things coming down through in the meta. So happy to take that one. And I think also the adaptation, the change from the first week of the LCS on the live patch where so many teams were wanting to basically just preemptively, pre you know, be cautious and ban out the things that they were hearing about or worried about in solo queue. Now we're starting to see, hey, Smolder's new, no problem. You can roll them through, you can try it out, see how it is. Still, uh, our review on Smolder's gonna take a little bit more time, still seeing a plo a pros, sorry, uh, figure out exactly what type of build they wanna be going through on this champion. We've seen a couple of them, S and Cerebro, we've seen the Shojin build. Definitely more so a favor of the Shojin build in comparison. I think Essence Reaver is leaving you far too squishy as you're going to be blown up a little bit later on into the game when you have, eventually, the damage necessary. But outside of calling for Mom as backup, we've not seen too many impactful Smolder things early. And sometimes that ulti is really underwhelming. It's this massive-looking <laughs> animation, and it does, like, 90 damage to somebody. But... Uh... Still waiting to see. Maybe he'll be popping up in some solo lanes as well, which is something people thought of as soon as this guy uh, was announced. FlyQuest have broken a curse, and that is the Shopify Rebellion curse. This squad has three wins, and it's against Cloud9, NRG, and now FlyQuest. And C9 and NRG both proceeded to go on huge lose streaks after dropping that game to Shopify. But FlyQuest 
holds on to that first place spot, they're able to bounce back against the mortals on day two. They, they held some type of cleansing ceremony to get rid of the Shopify Whew. rebellion curse, the, the leftover TSM curse that just hangs around is there on him as you pass. It's a the ghost from... for sure, the ghost of Reggie Pass. Oh no, no way, stay away. <laughs> that is the true nightmare. But you're looking at FlyQuest and what they did in that rebound uh, after their, their loss of Shopify rebellion, this was good stuff from this FlyQuest team. Of course, you saw Whippo doing what Whippo does on the Udyr champion, making himself impossible to take down. And extra impossible when the ADTF is what you're banking on being the damage to take down that Udyr. I'm, I'm telling you, you can skip that movie. It's not going to work out the way that you want for that ADTF. That was certainly a choice that we have not seen for quite a while. And for quite a while, I mean, it's been over a decade since we have seen bottom lane Twisted Fate. You think we're going to go another decade <laughs> before we see it again? If you're watching that game, probably, yeah. It should maybe even be longer, especially if you pair it upside. Uh, what Broken Blade was doing TF top, we'd say, okay, get that out of bot lane. Never want to see it there again. Yeah, that's got to be the way that you're looking at it. But this was good for FlyQuest, good rebound for them. And then obviously the bigger real story is that one when you're looking at how things went for Cloud9 and for NRG after they had their slip up and the way that it turned into a slumbo slide. Looking at how it goes for FlyQuest to stop that one is a good sign from them. I think individually, uh, we can look at some players. I think not maybe the best week from Jensen, certainly one to keep track of as a, as a player that I think a lot of people still have some questions on. Some of them answered in the first couple of weeks, a couple of new ones after this week. Let's see how, how it goes the next week. Is that bottom half of the LCS is no joke. Dig, IMT, Shopify, they can all legit take games off of anyone in the league. Yeah, first reaction to that is number one, thankfully we don't have two teams hanging out at the bottom because you Can better you believe, Oof. you better believe, and especially with the way things were shaping up from Evil Geniuses and Golden Guardians level of commitment, you've seen it through many different avenues from Immortals, Dignitas, 100 Thieves, throw in any of them, Team Liquid, Shopify Rebellion, we've had them all find their way to make an upset. This really has been the year of unpredictability in the LCS. Bottom feeder's not so bad in NA right now, but that is it today for League Unlock. Eric and Mark here with you, Beauty. Thanks for watching, and we'll catch you on that flippity flip.